Thank you, Tyler. Hey, let's take our Bibles and turn to James chapter number four. James chapter number four. And um, I'll tell you a short story real quick before uh, we, we turn over there. Kids were telling short stories around the dinner table uh, yesterday. And I remember one that Brother Ron told me. Uh, a pig walked into a barbecue joint. <laughs> short story there. That's it. That's all you get. So anyway, they don't get much better than that. Amen. James chapter 4, we'll continue here and uh, try to connect the dots uh, in the book of James and understand uh, kind of the theme and the, and the process of, of thought here. And uh, it's, been an, it's been a help to me, it's been an encouragement to me, it's been a, a blessing to me to be able to take the book of James and look at it this way. So uh, what, what is the, uh, how did James start? It started this way. Uh, there's trouble in life. And count it all joy when God uh, counts you worthy to experience a little bit of trouble. Uh, because in that trouble, in that tribulation, God has a work that he's doing for your good and for his glory. And for those who are filled with faith and who endure that tribulation uh, because they have prayed for wisdom, God has granted them wisdom, and they've walked in that wisdom, uh, God has a reward laid up for them in heaven. And so we believe that with all our heart, that God has a reward for those who are faithful in tribulation. God has a reward for those who in the last month, uh, the six weeks, have been faithful to him uh, through the coronavirus epidemic. God has a reward. Uh, there are many Christians who clocked out on God. They just took a vacation from the Lord. Uh, well, they missed the reward in the time of trouble but there are others who've been faithful to the lord and walked in wisdom and have uh, come victoriously thus far and i promise you uh, god has according to his word a reward laid up for you now uh, he continues on and, and connects the dots for us in the rest of the um, uh, the rest of the the book to help us to know how to walk in that wisdom that we receive from the lord uh, the wisdom comes from the Word of God, and, uh, and He wants us to walk in that Word. Uh, there's, there's a number of temptations that come along during tribulation and during trials. Uh, temptations not that are for our good, but temptations that are for our downfall. Uh, temptations that would come not from the Lord, and trials that would not be allowed by the Lord, but uh, troubles and, and temptations and solicitations to do evil that would come from Satan himself and from our own flesh and uh, from the world around us. And God, God warns us not to respond the wrong way in trials and troubles and tribulations, but to respond the right way if we will uh, experience that blessing. Uh, the uh, chapter number one, uh, hold your finger there in chapter four, but in chapter number one, uh, we, uh, we are, are reminded of the fact that uh, solicitation to do evil, the temptation to do wrong, is a constant um, part of our life. There, there won't a day go by that you won't be tempted to respond the wrong way, uh, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, think the wrong thing. Uh, there just won't be a day that goes by that you won't be tempted to uh, forego doing the right thing. Uh, it, it's just a battle of the flesh and the spirit. Uh, along the way and we have to yield to the spirit and walk in the grace that God gives us and uh, and we'll be victorious that way uh, verse number 13 chapter 1 says let no man say when he is tempted I am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil neither tempteth he any man now God allows trials and tribulations for our good but he doesn't want us to respond the wrong way in those trials uh, the the temptation to respond the wrong way is natural that just that's already in us uh, it says in verse 14, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own, what's the next word, church? Lust. So inside us is a, is a desire uh, for things that we ought not have a desire for. And that's what, that's what the devil took advantage of. When he tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, he took advantage of that, um, uh, that uh, the desire, the, the natural desire to, to see things and want them. And and he deceived Eve and, and caused her to lust after uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, she followed that lust, and uh, of course that resulted in sin. 
And the Bible says, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So the wages of sin is death. Um, sin starts when we yield to temptation. Temptation uh, uh, begins when we are drawn away or lured away or enticed away of our own lust. Now, that's not too hard to do, is it? All you've got to do is put a snicker bar uh, out there in front of me. And, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering where that snicker bar came from. I'm wondering who put that there. And why did they put that there? Was that put there as a gift for me? In my house, if anything like that is left laying around, immediately everybody assumes that it was left there for them. And so we'll walk in sometimes and say, who got my candy? Well, I didn't know it was yours. And that was the answer because their, their lust drew them away and they were enticed and tempted and they took uh, something that didn't belong to them and ate it and then uh, too late now, it's gone. But uh, that lust, uh, that desire is, is in us. Now, what does that have to do with chapter 4? I'm going to show you uh, here directly. Normally when I preach from chapter 4, especially these first few verses of chapter 4, it's a message on prayer. How to pray and get the ear of God and how to pray in faith and how to pray in confidence and how to pray with, with courage and how to pray the right way. Uh, a lot of times, that this is a go-to text for prayer. But this evening, when we look at James chapter 4, we're not looking at it in regards to prayer. Uh, we're looking at it in regards to the context uh, of the book of James. Here's a uh, here are some folks. Troubles come. Trials come. Temptations come. How are you going to respond to those? Are you going to respond in faith? Are you going to respond in wisdom that comes from above? Or are you going to respond uh, in a natural, fleshly, lustful way? And this is, uh, as C.I. Schofield puts it in his notes, uh, a rebuke of worldliness. A rebuke of worldliness. And it's exactly uh, what we find here. What I want you to notice tonight is this, simply this. Uh, what is the root of worldliness? Is worldliness a hairstyle? It's not a hairstyle. Is worldliness uh, uh, the way you dress? Not necessarily. You're not worldly because you dress a certain way. You're not worldly because you have your hair uh, cut a certain way. Is worldliness the music you listen to? It says, that's, that music's of the world. That's worldly music. You're a worldly person if you listen to that music. Well, I would say worldliness is not because of the music we listen to. You see, those are fruits. Those are not roots. And uh, we're going to find today uh, where the root of worldliness is and what the results of worldliness are. And that's going to help us respond in faith when trials and troubles come. Look with me now at James chapter 4. Verse number 1 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? So, so who is the you, first of all? Let's answer that question. Uh, James chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So uh, we believe these are uh, believers of the first church in Jerusalem that because of persecution were scattered. Uh, they, they went down to Samaria. They went down to the uttermost parts of the earth, uh, Antioch and other places. They're just kind of scattered around. And James, the pastor of the church there in Jerusalem, is trying to stay connected to um, his church members as they have had to leave Jerusalem because of persecution. Now, as they have left Jerusalem and found themselves in other places, uh, what he's noticing and what he's hearing back is that folks aren't responding to the tribulation and having to uh, flee Jerusalem because of the, uh, the persecution. They've not necessarily always responded to that trouble uh, properly. And, uh, and in some cases, they've been, um, uh, you know, treating uh, the wealthy better than those who have uh, no means. They've been overlooking the widows and the orphans. And they've been uh, maybe a little bit more inclined to uh, look out for number one than to look out for others. And he's trying to encourage this group of people, say, uh, and, and let them know that in trouble and tribulation, the first person to protect is not yourself. The first, first person to look out for is not yourself. Uh, the first person to uh, pay attention to is not yourself. It's those around you. 
be a blessing to those around you. Be a help to those around you. Use your tongue in a way to be a, a, an, a, an encouragement and help to those around you, not just to protect yourself. Uh, you say, how do you know that? Well, uh, it's, it's uh, obvious that there, uh, there have been reports of trouble. Because he says there in verse 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? So first we find that this matter of worldliness has a fruit, and the fruit uh, that we find here that it has is, uh, uh, is, is a dissension and, and it's trouble uh, amongst brethren. It's turmoil, and he calls it wars and fightings. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, in verse number 2, he, call, uh, he said it, it, it yields the, um, the, the murder and, and stealing and wars and, and, and hurt. He says th this is not good. You're, you're out there looking out for yourself and you've, you've forgotten about the widows. You've forgotten about the helpless. You've forgotten about uh, the orphans. And you're, you're, um, you're, you're saying things and doing things that are uh, enriching yourself. And you're not, you're not as concerned about others as you ought to be. He says, why is this? Why is this? Where did these, these troubles come from? This, this uh, fighting, this bickering, this arguing, this scraping and scratching, uh, gouging one another's eyes. Where does it come from? Uh, what's another result of uh, worldliness? Not only is it trouble uh, in the body of Christ with one another, uh, but it's also trouble with God. Trouble with God. Verse 2, he says, uh, Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye have not because ye ask not. Well, God tells us when we're not in fellowship with one another, we're not in fellowship with him. And if we're not forgiving one another, we can't uh, walk in fellowship and be forgiven of God and, and have that, that constant communion and have that, that instant connection uh, and, and receive the grace to help in time of need. So he says, because of worldliness, you're at odds with one another. Because of worldliness, you're at odds with with me it says uh in in verse number three uh because of worldliness ye ask and receive not so sometimes you do call on me and sometimes you ask uh, but i'm not there to help you maybe you ask your brothers and sisters in christ for help but they are not there to help you uh you do not receive when you ask because it says you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts now what was it about lusts that we saw there in chapter 1. Well, we're drawn away of our own lust and uh, tempted. And then uh, what do we do? With temptation it, uh, is available. We're drawn away of our lust to yield to that temptation. We sin and then uh, we lose our, our fellowship with the Lord, our walk with the Lord. So he says, I, I'm not in the business of enabling you to walk farther away from me. I, why would I want to help you chase the lustful desires of your heart and, and, and encourage you and, and help you and enable you and provide opportunities for you uh, to sin against me? I'm not, that's, that's not a good father, is it? A good father is, is not going to enable a child to do wrong. A good father is going to do the best he can to step in the way of that child and basically to say, you know, if you want to do wrong, you're going to do it over my dead body. I'm not going to I'm not going to lay down and let you do wrong. I'm going to do everything I can to encourage you and help you to be a roadblock uh, for you uh, so that you might turn around and, uh, and do right. So, and that's the, the Heavenly Father. Now, uh, what, what is this matter of worldliness? If it's not a hairstyle, if it's not the clothes we wear, it's not the music we listen to, uh, if, if worldliness is not even the style of worship that a church would choose, what is worldliness? Well, I'll tell you what worldliness is. It's a condition of the heart. That's the condition of the heart. It's just a, a love of something that is greater than our love for the Lord. And it will manifest itself. It will show itself in a number of different ways uh, in, in different individuals. But uh, it, it always results in uh, troubled relationships. It always results in a loss of fellowship with the Lord. It results in a prayer life that is... Uh, that is essentially non-existent. And um, why, why is it this way? Well, because uh, verse 4 explains it to us. It says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. 
Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Um, that, that word friendship means you like the world and the world likes you. You've got, you've got a relationship with the world. And if you've got a relationship with the world, I don't think that you have a relationship with me. So why would somebody have a relationship with the world? Because our, our hearts are already prone to it. Our lusts are already uh, in us. And we, if we follow and yield to temptation, we'll chase after the things of the world rather than the things of God. He says, if you do that, uh, you're not, the, you're not uh, the friendship of the world. is the enmity with God. And whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth uh, to envy? Uh, so the Lord uh, bought us with a price, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He shed his blood uh, for us. We, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And our response is to glorify the Lord in our, in our heart, in our mind, and in our body. And when we yield to the lust of the flesh and we uh, yield to temptation and we sin, uh, then uh, we, uh, we have demonstrated that our friendship and our loyalty is not with God, but it's with the world. I thought about illustrations of this in the scripture. Look with me in the book of uh, Jude. The book of Jude. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, then Revelation. And in the book of Jude, we read about three uh, individuals in verse number 11. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, ran in greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Thought about those three individuals. And the testimony that they had, all of these individuals at one point in their life testified of, uh, of a relationship with God. But all of these individuals uh, got themselves in a place where they had no uh, walk with God uh, so that God could not hear their prayers and answer their prayers. All of these individuals got themselves in a place where they were at odds with their brothers in Christ or at least those who claimed to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And all of these got themselves in a place where uh, their hearts were revealed by their actions. We don't have time to, to look in the scriptures at all of them, but I'll remind you of Cain. God, uh, through Adam and Eve, had uh, revealed to their sons, Cain and Abel, that there was a way to approach God, and that was through a blood sacrifice. And, of course, that was a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be the last blood that would be shed for the sins of mankind. And so they would come to God by faith and demonstrate that faith through their obedience in a blood sacrifice. Cain, however, decided to worship God uh, in his own way. He, uh, in, in pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency, he decided to give God uh, the best he had to offer and the fruits of the ground. And rather than a blood sacrifice, and God, God came to him and said, Hey, Cain, you've, uh, this is not the best way to do it. Um, uh, you, could, you could make things right. And God accepted Abel's sacrifice. Uh, Cain became jealous of Abel. Cain killed Abel. And uh, God, uh, God gave Cain the opportunity to return and repent and, uh, and, and restore his fellowship with him. But Cain had dis de uh, demonstrated something in all of his actions. He demonstrated that he loved um, himself and the world more than he loved uh, the Lord. And the world here, worldliness, is talking about not, not the blue skies and the green grass, but worldliness is talking about the way of the world, whose, um, whose God is whom? Satan. Uh, it's talking about um, turning your eyes and heart away from God and toward a system uh, whose prince is the devil. And who is God-less, so to speak. And our, our, the, the, that lust to do that, the desire to do that, is already in all of us because of our old nature. And so Cain, he walked in, in the way of his own lust, demonstrated that he loved the world. 
uh, and, and showed that he was at enmity with God, lost fellowship with his family, lost fellowship with, his, uh, with God the Father. Not only did Cain uh, demonstrate these things, uh, but, but uh, also Korah. Uh, Korah wanted something. Korah wanted influence, and Korah wanted uh, to, uh, to, um, to have some of the glory that God was giving to Moses and Aaron and, and the other leaders there in, uh, in Israel. And Korah uh, began to stand against the Lord and stand against Moses. And um, what, what did, drove him to do that? Just the, the lust of the flesh. And rather than walk with the Lord, he, he followed the lust uh, and uh, the temptation that was set before him. And he was drawn away of that lust, and then he sinned. And so his fellowship with his uh, brothers, uh, his uh, Jewish uh, community, was broken. His fellowship with God was broken, and um, he, he perished. Well, uh, there's also one other, Balaam. Balaam, who was uh, also tempted and drawn away of his own lust, and he sinned against God. And he, the Bible says, did that for reward. He wanted money. So uh, Cain uh, wanted to know that he was righteous in and of himself. Uh, Balaam wanted uh, money. Korah wanted uh, prestige and power and influence. And all of these things are, are natural desires of every human heart. And um, we have to be careful that we don't follow in those lusts. And that's what I believe we, we're finding here. Worldliness. Some you say, well, preacher, I'm not worldly. You know, I don't look like other people. I even wear a coat and tie to church. I'm not worldly. I don't listen to, to worldly music. I listen to, to gospel music and Christian music. And, and, I, and I, I sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. I'm not worldly. You say, preacher, I'm not worldly. I, I keep my hair off my ears and off my collar. And I, and I look like uh, uh, what people think a Christian maybe ought to look like. Well, can I tell you, worldliness is not just what you wear and how you look and what you watch on TV. Those things are just fruits. Worldliness is a condition of the heart. A condition of the heart. So that when temptation arises, and it will arise, the temptation to turn that dial in the, in, in, in the car to a radio station you ought not be listening to, that temptation is going to be ever-present. The temptation to turn the television to a channel you ought not be watching or to scroll uh, through the websites and web pages that you have no business on, that temptation is always going to be present there. And the lust is, is in us because of the old nature to be drawn away and tempted and enticed uh, to follow and yield to those temptations. And it's when we're worldly at our heart that we do that, that we yield to those temptations. Like Cain, like Balaam, like Korah. We read in the book of Proverbs that we are to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It says, guard your heart. So keep your heart pure. In the book of Psalms, we'll read this a number of times. Uh, the psalmist will pray, uh, Lord, uh, you know, I, I want to have a perfect heart before you. And you say, well, what is a perfect heart? Is that a sinless heart? No, it's a heart that is single in its focus. Rather than allowing the temptations of the world uh, to entice our flesh, we keep our eyes and our heart and our mind fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's what a perfect heart is. It's one who keeps their eyes on the Lord. David was a man after God's own heart. The Bible speaks of, of him as a man who has a perfect heart. His heart was single uh, he had a single mind, a single heart, a single purpose, and it was the Lord. And we're encouraged to do that. Now, uh, the trouble is this. In the book of James, when temptation arises, and I'm talking about tribulation, Job kind of temptation, troubles come up out of nowhere, coronavirus springs up, uh, you lose your job, uh, you, you, it's, uh, you know, finances get tight. So you start thinking, how am I going to get out of this situation? How will I alleviate this pressure? How will I, re how will I resolve these problems? Uh, many times we are tempted to resolve them and deal with them in the wrong way, in a worldly fashion. 
And the Satan will always give you an opportunity. I'm lonely. I'm 30 years old and I'm not married and I sure would like to have a wife and I'd like to have companionship. Hey, you know what? The devil will definitely provide you an opportunity with that. And you have to be careful uh, not to be drawn away of their own natural lust and yield to temptation and try to alleviate these, these, um, the desires of the flesh uh, with sinful decisions. That's what he's saying here. Worldliness will lead you away from fellowship uh, with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Worldliness will lead you away from fellowship with God. Worldliness will get you in a position where you can't pray and talk to God and receive from God what you need. So rather than, um, rather than being a friend of the world, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and walk in faith with him. Uh, let me show you uh, what happened to the nation of Israel. Uh, through Balaam, when, uh, when the, the desires of Balaam began to infect the rest of the nation. Uh, Numbers chapter number 25. Numbers chapter 25. Balaam, remember, was enticed by Balak, the king of Midian, to, uh, to curse the children of Israel. And Balaam was going to do it. I mean, the, the reward for doing so was so great, Balaam couldn't turn it down. And uh, he, he tried to figure out a way to do it. God says, I don't want you to do that. And Balaam said, well, you know, I, 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 there's got to be a way to do that. Eventually, God said, hey, go do it. So Balaam gets on his donkey, and he's riding away. And, uh, and what does his donkey do? His donkey stops uh, there. And y'all remember the story of the talking donkey there. Well, God, uh, God comes back and, and lets Balaam know that you can speak, but you're going to bless Israel. You're not going to curse Israel. So three different times, Balak takes him up to a high place, has him overlook the, uh, the territory. And Balaam says, listen, you know, I can only say what God wants me to say. And Balak says, okay, well, maybe your God will change his mind this time. And after the third time, Balak realized, uh, this guy is only going to bless Israel. He's not going to curse them. Well, do you think Balaam's heart changed? It never changed. Balaam wanted the reward that Balak had to offer. Balaam himself, even though he could not curse Israel, he still wanted to get a hold of that money that was provided to him uh, through uh, Balak and the Midianites. So he, uh, we understand, came up with another plan to get the children of Israel uh, to uh, experience not the blessings of God, but the cursings of God which is what Balak wanted uh, anyway. Well, how did he do that? Ma uh, Numbers chapter 25, Balaam, uh, it says in verse 1, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. So what happened was that they, they, they camped out near the Moabites, and they saw there um, the, uh, the daughters of Moab uh, dancing in the field, and they saw them with their... Uh, systems of worship that involve prostitution and the natural desires uh, and the lust of the, the men of Israel's hearts, uh, they were led away by those lusts. They were tempted. They sinned. The Bible says in verse number um, 3 that uh, Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, a false god. Not only did they, uh, they, they, they eat their goods and and. Uh, and and joined in their festivities and, and uh, became part of their uh, 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 sinful manner of worship. Um, but they, they began themselves to bow down to the false gods and join themselves to Baal Peor. Well, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun and that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. So he says, in broad daylight, take the men, the princes of Israel, who are responsible for following the counsel of Balaam, and uh, make sure that people see them in broad daylight, uh, exor the judgment of God exercised upon them. It, it ought to be, a, it ought to be a, a way to kind of stem the tide and turn people back from following after the lust of their heart. You think that worked? <laughs> Not hardly. Uh, God did, and the people did, exercise judgment. Verse 5 says, Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one um, his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. So every tribe, the leaders of those tribes, went through their tribe, and uh, they were to kill 
the men who were turned unto Baal Peor. They followed the lusts of their heart. Uh, in their heart they were worldly, and they turned away from God because they loved the things of the world more than they loved God. And they turned to false gods, and uh, they, the judgment was, was exercised. Verse number 5 says, Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. Now, how, how bold and brazen is that? You know, here's the thing about worldliness. Worldliness, when it, become, when it grips your heart, when you respond to trouble and tribulation, here these folks are wandering in the wilderness and they've been eating manna and, and all of a sudden they see these, uh, these Moabites and now they're down there worshiping their false god, Baal Peor, and they've got food galore. And they, these ladies are dancing around and they're, they're half clothed and the men are just enthralled with this, this worship of this false god and how that they could have their bellies filled and the lust of their hearts satisfied. And they just... They just uh, like like lambs to a slaughter, just rush down into that place, and they begin to partake of, of those festivities. Well, uh, Moses says, "Listen, we got to take care of this. Uh, the heads of the uh, of the the judges, the heads of the the tribes, go in there and go through your tribe and cleanse your tribe." Well, as these men in broad daylight are being killed for their uh, worldliness, a man comes running into the camp with the Midianite woman. Uh, a Moabitish woman there, and, and, and in broad daylight, he is going to do uh, and, and follow after uh, the course of action that others have followed. Well, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, people who were mourning because their father, their brother, their uncle, uh, their son, just died because of their sin. And this man comes running in past them with this Midianitish woman. And uh, with no regard, he's, he's so full, his heart is so full of worldliness, his heart is so full of, uh, of, um, of being drawn away of his own lust that he has no regard for others, no regard for God. He comes running past everybody who's uh, basically at a funeral, and, uh, and what do they do? Well, verse 7 says, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from the congregation. He took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent. So this man takes his Midianite woman back to his tent and um, fulfills with her the lust of his flesh. And, and Phinehas walks in with a javelin in his hand, and he sticks them both through says, he went after the man of Israel into the tent, thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. The plague. You say, what, what's a plague? Well, you, as, as quickly as coronavirus has spread throughout our world through a transmission, there were diseases that the children of Israel contracted from the Midianites uh, and the Moabites that, that just literally spread through their um, midst, uh, like a wildfire. Now, God allowed that to happen. It was a judgment of God. And the Bible says that this particular plague that went through them, it says that uh, 20 and 4,000 in that plague died, not including uh, the men who were killed because of uh, their sin. So I think, about, I think about Balaam. I think about the effect that he had on others. And I think about how easy it is to have a heart that is not perfect before the Lord. And how easy it is to have a heart that we have not with all diligence kept. And because our heart has a measure of worldliness, it's revealed in the fact that what our flesh desires and when temptations are, are made available we, w without hesitation, tend to run and fulfill those lusts. I cannot tell you the, the most dangerous uh, aspect of James chapter number 4 is not failing to ask. He says, you have not because you ask not. And oftentimes we say, well, we don't have answers to our prayers because we're not praying to God. But can I remind you, why weren't these folks inclined to pray to God? Because they were, 
their hearts were worldly. And they were looking to uh, take care of their troubles, not in a godly fashion, but in an ungodly fashion. They didn't even think about talking to God. They didn't even think about praying to God. They weren't even concerned about asking the Lord. And those who were thinking about asking God for his help were like Balaam. Their hearts were not pure before God. They didn't want God for God's sake. They wanted God to help them fulfill their lustly desires. Balaam wanted God to help him fill his pockets with gold. Balaam didn't want to walk with God and worship God and serve God. Balaam wanted gold in his pockets. And so the, the fastest way to do that was not to walk with God by faith, but the fastest way to do that was to make friends with the world who had immediate access to riches. Think about this. In verse number 3, uh, the, the biggest problem is not prayerlessness. The biggest problem in, in James chapter 4 is not uh, praying for the wrong things, but the biggest problem that we find here in James chapter 4 is the condition of the heart of the one who is praying or not praying. And what is the condition of the heart? Verse 4 reveals that to us. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain? Does God mean what he says? That's, what the, that's a paraphrase of that little uh, phrase. Uh, does God mean what he says? How about, the, how about it, church? Does God mean what he says? Absolutely. And when God says he is jealous over us, is he really jealous over us? Absolutely. And if we turn our affection and our attention away from him and our hearts are filled with worldliness, and in times of tribulation and in times of trouble, in times of heartache, we seek to alleviate our troubles uh, by following the lust of our flesh and yielding to temptation, is that going to be effective and prof profitable for us? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Is God going to help us with that? No, he's not going to help us with that. There is help, but there is not help for the one whose heart is turned away from the Lord. There's only help for the heart that is turned towards God. Now, that's next week's message. We'll stop there. Uh, but before we, before we finish, take your Bible and turn over to the book of uh, 1 John. 1 John. So tonight, we kind of told you about the problem and the consequences of the problem. The problem is worldliness, a heart that is not in tune with the Lord. Uh, the consequences is uh, a broken relationships with others, broken relationships with God, and no help for ourselves, no lasting help for ourselves, only increased trouble. Uh, next week we'll talk about the cure for all that, uh, but we find here in, in 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 15, these words. John was trying to encourage uh, believers in the first century. Uh, it's not even 100 A.D. yet. I mean, not even, you know, uh, half a century has passed since the Lord Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven. I mean, the church is really young. The church is really new. The church is growing. Uh, but Satan is doing his dead level best to get the church not to follow the Lord by faith, but to walk in the dictates of their own lust, as uh, James told us uh, we are inclined to do anyway. John says this in verse number 15. First John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, you're not going to love the things that are in the world if you don't love the world. It just makes sense. So, uh, worldliness starts in the heart, and then it's demonstrated in other ways. Love not the things of the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. The world tells you, if it feels good, do it. And the Lord says, wait a minute, you've got to back up and think about this. The, uh, sin is pleasurable, but for a season. God says, don't trade the temporal for the eternal. Don't try to, to get out of a, a, a don't, don't try a quick fix to a problem. Fix your faith on the Lord instead. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, 
It's not of the Father, it's of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, man's out of money. And he's, he's got some bills to pay. And he's looking for a quick cash. Hey, the devil will give you a, a way to make quick cash. He'll say, if you take that dollar you got in your pocket and go buy a lottery ticket, you'll take that, uh, that dollar you got in your pocket and you go down to the casino. If you go uh, 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 down and, and uh, gamble with your friends a little bit with that dollar in your pocket, you might could take that dollar and turn it into $5. That's the way the devil works. The devil may come to you and say, hey, listen, well, you know, this is not really legal, but uh, you can make a quick profit and an easy profit if you'll do it. Uh, just take these drugs and deliver them uh, to this side of the neighborhood. And the devil will provide you opportunities like that. Or he might take an upstanding businessman and say, this is not really ethical, uh, not really moral. But if you'll just take these numbers right here and change them and swap them around, that's going to help your bottom line this month. And the devil tempts us in times of trouble uh, to just do things that aren't right and aren't honest, and aren't true, and aren't profitable. The Satan says, I can help you right now if you'll just walk with me. And God says, listen, that's temporal. If you'll do the will of the fa God, the Father, and in temptation, don't go the way of the world. Don't yield to trouble the way the world yields to trouble. Don't try to appease and, and, and satisfy the flesh the way the world tries to do that. Trust the Lord. The world says, Hey, if you want a wife, just go get a wife. As a matter of fact, if you want a wife, you don't even have to have a wife. You can go get a girl and live like you're, she's your wife. And you don't even have to make a commitment to that. And you can have all the pleasures of having a wife without having a wife and no responsibility. There's a quick, easy way out. And that's what the world would tell you. But God says, the world passes away in the lust thereof. And it's a temporal fix to a, 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 a temptation and a problem. And it's not going to last forever. But the will of God abideth forever. The devil tells you, you got a little, little discomfort in your relationship with your husband and your wife. And the devil comes along and says, well, you'd be better off a separate than together. You've fallen out of love with each other and, and you're just fighting all the time. Uh, you'd, it'd be better for you, it'd be better for the kids, it'd be better for everybody if you just got a divorce and called it quits. Uh, can I just tell you? You'll, you'll live with that decision the rest of your life. And the, the, the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. See, the, the world always has a fix to our problem. It might be a pill. It might be a bottle. It might be an illicit relationship. It might be uh, unethical treatment of others or business. The world always has a, pro a solution to our problems, but the world's solutions are temporal. They're not lasting. God says, oh, be careful. Be careful of worldliness because when temptation comes, the lust of the flesh is already there, and if your heart is not fixed on God, you're going to find yourself following the way of Balaam and Korah, following in the way of, uh, of Cain, following in the way of all of Israel who, who rushed down to the Midianites to fulfill the lust of their flesh to fill their bellies. God says, this is not good. This is not good. God, God loves you more than that. How many of you believe God loves you? I believe he does. How many of you believe God wants his best for you? Absolutely. Uh, think about Samson. God had pretty big plans for Samson, didn't he? But what was it that caused Samson's life to be such a miserable wreck? He loved the world more than he loved God. And uh, God still accomplished his purpose through Samson, but Samson didn't get any glory for it. And uh, he missed the blessings God had for him. Don't miss the blessings, amen? Fix your eyes on faith. There's an easy way out. Don't take that easy way out. Uh, trust the Lord. Humble yourself. And we'll find the key uh, to getting that help next Sunday night. Father in heaven, we love you. The devil is crafty. He is a deceiver. He is not there to help us. He is there to hurt us and to harm us. He's our adversary. 
uh, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to uh, take our testimony and destroy it. He wants to take our witness and make it null and void. He wants to uh, take us out of the gospel business. And Father, uh, so many believers have been taken out of the gospel business because they allowed the world to capture their hearts. And they resolved their problems, not in the way that you would have us to resolve them, but in the way that the world tells us we ought to resolve them. And Father, there's no help there. There's no, there's no unity among the brethren there. There's no fellowship with the Father there. It only leads to troubles and problems. Father, help us to keep our heart with all diligence. Help us to realize that it's out of that heart that proceed uh, the affairs of our life. Help us, Lord, to have a perfect heart, a single heart, a heart with one purpose and one purpose only, to love you and to love others as ourselves. Father, we know that if we'll do that, you will bless us and help us and strengthen us for your glory. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let's stand together real quick. Caden's going to play our invitation hymn. There may be something in your life right now. You say, preacher, there's a... There is a pressure on me right now.